Well, good evening, folks. Matt? Yes, sir. Ready to roll? Ready to roll? Ready to roll. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the third and final uh, candidate question and answer forum uh, hosted by Monroe County Community College. My name is Dr. Matthew Birdmeyer, and I have with me uh, my colleagues behind, working behind the scenes to help uh, keep this event running smoothly. I have Dan Wood, Assistant Professor of Criminal Justice, Melissa Gray, Psychology Professor, Jenna Bazell, Assistant Professor of English, uh, Michelle Pallad of Monroe County Radio, I have Tom Ryder, our coordinator of campus and community events. I uh, have uh, Cole Younglove, uh, one of our Agora newspaper um, uh, staff members. And I also have Penny Dorsey, assistant to the president. So a few things, a few housekeeping things to begin uh, with here. If you could please keep your microphones muted, that will help prevent uh, crosstalk and any uh, feedback from uh, speakers. Uh, also note the graphics here. Uh, the the green box will show you how to mute your microphone to and verify that it is in fact muted. Uh, it'll have the red uh, cross through the microphone icon. If you want to make, uh, if you want to submit a question, uh, you can do that in the chat function and you'll see the orange box here um, encircling the, uh, the chat icon. Uh, to send us a question, please send it to Cole Young, Younglove. And I just posted that in the chat. So if you open up the chat on the right side of your screen, you will see, please send your questions to Cole Younglove in the chat. Uh, to do that, you will see the two uh, function there at the bottom. Hit that arrow and find Cole Younglove and send him your questions. And we will uh, uh, get the questions out of, out of the chat that way. Um, okay, so I'll come back to the slide after a few opening remarks from our president. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Matt, and good, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I, I just want to take a, a moment to thank all of you. But before we, I say anything else, could we just observe a moment of silence, if we could? We lost our uh, journalism, former journalism professor, Dan Shaw, um, almost two weeks ago. So uh, could we, in, in memory of Dan and 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 many others that who've passed recently. Let's just observe a moment of silence, please. Okay, thank you. So if you can, if you can see the screen, um, we are, Monroe County Community College is also on the ballot and it's a zero increase millage. It's a renewal, so it's not additional taxes. I, I just want to let you know that because the Bedford Press erroneously reported in the latest edition, they say it's an additional millage, and it is absolutely not an additional millage. We're not asking for any additional money. It's a zero increase millage. So whatever you're paying in taxes, taxes currently, you will continue to pay for, for the college. And as for infrastructure, nothing for operations whatsoever. So just to clarify, it's not an additional millage. And so uh, um, we've been here for 56 years as your institution. We serve, if, if, if I could see all of you, I'd ask for a show of hands, how many of you have actually uh, been to this institution, have family members, friends, or enemies who attended this institution? And, and, and I'm sure <laughs> many hands would go up. But um, thank you for being here this evening, and we hope that you will certainly support our millage, the only college in this county. And if you're so inclined, as you make your comments, feel free to let people know that you support Monroe County Community College. So with that, back over to Matt. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Melissa, could you flip back to the second slide? So while that slide's coming up, let me uh, give you an overview of who we have on tap for tonight. Uh, we will start off with the 56th district state representative race. We have three candidates in that race. Uh, Keith Kitchens, TC Clements, Clements, Jeffrey John Ruble, 
We will then move on to the 17th district state representative race. We have two candidates there, uh, Christopher Slatt and Joe Bellino. Uh, from there, we'll go to district five county commissioner. We have Bill Lavoy and Randy Richardville. Uh, we will move then to district eight county commissioner where we have Greg Moore. And finally, we will end with uh, Bedford Township Supervisor, and we have Paul Peroni and Stephanie Zarb. So with that said, this is the format for tonight. Uh, so candidates, listen up. Uh, I will ask you all uh, the same question to begin with. You'll have two minutes each to answer one at a time. Uh, when we get to the, uh, the, the last candidate, uh, we'll come back and um, you'll have one minute to respond. Uh, to your fellow candidates. So everybody, please be respectful. Uh, wait your turn. Don't, don't no interrupting, please. Um, for everybody, if you could uh, practice some uh, Zoom etiquette. So if you need to uh, stand up and walk away, uh, please turn off your camera. Um, if you are eating or anything like that, you know, same thing, kind of, you know, turn off your camera, please. Um, if you're joining the meeting on your phone, you can press star six to mute or unmute. Uh, again, if you have questions, uh, click on hit the chat button and uh, click on everyone and then find Cole, uh, Cole Younglove, and send him your questions and we will uh, get to those um, as many as we can tonight. Okay, so I think we're off and running. Uh, our first race is 56th District. And let me change my screen mode here. Uh, and we will start with Keith Kitchens. You Thank are. you very much. Thank All right, you. good deal. Uh, so just a, a heads up, everybody, we did provide the candidates with the questions ahead of time. Uh, we you know, ran into some time issues last night, so we've, we've whittled down the questions. We're trying to keep them to three questions, so um, you're not gonna get all of them tonight. Uh, so we'll start with this question here. Uh, describe your plans for addressing environmental issues in our district, such as clean water and pollution. So you have two minutes. While our quality has improved greatly in the last 50 years, it still remains an issue in major cities with large populations of air pollution. Water pollution, our rivers and reservoirs and lakes and seas are drowning in chemical wastes, plastics and other pollutants. Some 80% of the world's wastewater is dumped largely untreated. Back into the environment, polluting rivers and lakes, things we can do to support our local recycling programs. Reduce your plastic consumptions, reuse or recycle plastic when you can, properly dispose of chemical cleaners, oils, and non-biodegradable items to keep themselves ending up in the drain. If you have a yard, consider landscaping that reduces runoff and avoid applying pesticides and herbicides. If you have a dog, pick up he or she's yard waste, making sure it doesn't run off into the ground. Support the clean water rules, which clarifies the Clean Water Act. Tell our federal government, the US Army Corps of Engineers, and your elected officials that you support the Clean Water Act. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we will move next to T.C. Clements. Am I saying your name right? I saw T.C. He's, he's unmuted. TC, are you there? Can you hear me? I saw him. I, I did too. He's in the session and he's unmuted. Okay, if he's unmuted, then let's ask him the question. And hopefully he'll answer. <laughs> Mr. Clements, did, did, did you need me to re restate my question? I no, I didn't. I apologize. I got dropped, but I'm here now. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yes, there you are. Okay, great. I'll start the clock now. All right, perfect. 
First off, I had made a commitment to Dr. Kojo from our last uh, session that I neglected to state that I do, in fact, put a, uh, promote and uh, will be voting for the renewal of the Monroe County Community College Millage. Uh, Monroe County Community College has directly impacted our household. My 20-year-old graduated uh, with his associate arts degree there, um, and we are absolute supporters, as I believe that not only does it provide a great education, but it provides benefits to many residents as it improves the value of our homes uh, and it creates a destination within the county for people from outside our county to come receive education, uh, also do business with many vendors, restaurants, et cetera. To the environmental question, you know, for ages, the issue has been industry versus ecology. And it's been an age old battle that we haven't been able to solve. The benefit is we live in a time where technology is vastly improving at a pace that is just astounding at times. Uh, in Bedford Township, we have just um, begun and are in the process of redoing our wastewater treatment system. By using UV rays, we're able to make that system much more uh, ecologically friendly. Uh, and so it's a case where technology and industry aren't uh, opposed with one another. They actually can work hand in hand. So I think the biggest issue we have to do is be mindful of that. Um, one of the things we all absolutely would agree on, regardless of whether we're Green Party, a Democrat, Republican, Independent, is That's that without sense. water, life is going to be very difficult. Uh, water provides uh, life for animals, humans, plants, and so we have to be mindful of that. We have to watch how we allow PFAS to continue, what steps we can take to control that, and we have to be able to sit down and create consensus between multiple communities. Uh, it may even be that we have to look at incentivizing certain areas for good stewards. But I think a serious look to make sure that it's not something we push down the road, but address immediately is important. Great. Perfect timing. Okay, Mr. Rubley, same question. Sure. I think um, we, first of all, I mean, the Great Lakes are interconnected. Um, so it's, it's more broad than Michigan alone. Um, looking up data for this question, 30 million people get their water from the Great Lakes system. And approximately 35 million people live along the shorelines of the Great Lakes, um, which includes cities, the big cities of Chicago, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, which are heavy manufacturing centers, lots of industry there. Um, the problem is the Great Lakes is semi-closed system, so only, they only lose about 1% of the water down the St. Lawrence uh, Freeway, or, not Freeway, sorry, um, the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway annually. Um, it's estimated that 90, billions of, 90 billion liters of raw sewage gets dumped into the Great Lakes annually, and there's enough waste to fill over a million Olympic-sized uh, swimming pools, and that comes from safewater.org. Um, and I believe that needs to be, we need to form partnerships with the states that also border the Great Lakes, um, also Canada. Uh, they have lots of uh, border along the Great Lakes, and we need to fight this with regulation and uh, financing for studying the best and most efficient ways technology-wise uh, to combat um, the pollutants in the, the Great Lakes and the waste. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay, back to Mr. Kitchens. If, if uh, you would like, you have one minute to respond. I didn't hear too much in reference to uh, our recycling programs. I understand Bedford Township has a, a good recycling uh, program, uh, people uh, with Stevens uh, garbage disposal or the disposals that we have in Bedford Township, they have a recycling program. We have a definite recycling program uh, behind the township hall, I understand, that we can bring stuff and uh, lawn waste. At one time we go to King Mulch King in reference to dropping off our, our waste in reference to landscaping. Um, I would definitely like to uh, see more recycling, uh, plastics especially, because in the landfill, they just sit. They sit for years. They don't, dis they don't uh, incinerate, evaporate, or anything. It just sits there. So uh, I would support more recycling. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clements, one minute. I would just like to add that I think as we all would agree as we sit and watch this, um, we, we often find that words are cheap and actions speak much louder than words. Uh, I can't speak to the resumes of either one of uh, the two people running against me because it's been largely difficult to find a complete resume on a website or anywhere else. 
Uh, but I can tell you that I actually started a solar and wind technology company in the year 2006. Uh, subsequently sold my portion of that to my partner who continues to own it to this day. So it's a case where not only is ecology, uh, looking at alternative energies as a reality, something that I've done in my past, uh, but it's something that I believe in wholeheartedly. Uh, we have to be sure that we're taxing every opportunity available to us. Uh, we're learning each and every day that we don't live in a one-size-fits-all world. And as long as we're open to change so that it's beneficial to those around us, we can get great things done. Okay, Mr. Uh, Ruby. Well, uh, Reiterate, it's bigger than Michigan. Um, I think partnerships are essential uh, between states. Um, we can do recycling at the local level. Um, obviously, it will help at the local level, but it's, it's just much bigger than the 56th district or even the state of Michigan as far as water and air. Okay. We'll uh, move to Mr. Clements uh, for question number two. And that question is, explain how you plan to address drug addiction and human trafficking in our district. I think the biggest thing, uh, like many issues, is education. Um, we have to start early. The fact of the matter is, is anything we do after the fact, we've already largely lost the battle. Um, uh, within our legislature, much has been done in the last several years as I think society as a whole has begun to recognize that addiction is a far greater problem than we once thought it was. Uh, coming co off of the prescription medication wave, uh, we're realizing that it's a very insidious problem. It's something we have to get behind. If you look around our county, the local sheriff's office, the county commission, our jails, the courts are all taking incredibly serious. Uh, you have drug court now, family court, veterans court, and all of these are largely designed to factor in and to help people with addiction so that incarceration doesn't just become punitive only, but that it actually resolves and fix the problem. Um, I think one of the things we have to continue to look at is enhance legislation so that technology is an aid of ours. If you look at Senator Zorn, uh, Representative Bellino and Shepard, they've all been actively involved in legislation which makes prescription fraud much more difficult. Uh, this is an area given technology we can continue to work on. I think we also have to work to make sure that we're educating patients of the effects of the narcotics that are being prescribed to them prior to beginning them, uh, because I feel like oftentimes the information is gleaned after the fact, uh, and it provides problems that could have been mitigated early on. As it relates to the human trafficking, uh, I am a large uh, believer that this is an area that requires incredibly stiff penalties. Um, it is essentially the, two, the 2020 version of slavery. Um, we must continue to prosecute under the RICO Act. Um, as you know, I am endorsed by every police uh, association in the county, also a POAM of Michigan, and am a firm believer that we need to continue to defend our police, not to fund them, and I will work to aggressively prosecute and be sure funding is available so that resources can be enacted to stop and prevent, mitigate human trafficking. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Rubley, do you need me to uh, ask a question one more time? Oh, I think I got it. Um, okay. As far as the uh, drug addiction, um, obviously it's, a, it's an epidemic, um, huge problem uh, in our society, not just in the 56th district, but in this area of, of the country uh, overall. Um, and I think that community mental health needs to be beefed up, um, not only get bigger and, and more broad, um, but also the delivery mechanism. Uh, they need to have partnerships with our local police um, and they need to collaborate and they need to identify the families and make sure that they're supported um, as far as a, a rehabilitation model uh, and that they have what they need that is feeding that addiction. Uh, usually addiction comes with some kind of uh, life experience. Uh, sometimes it's uh, injury, uh, and something's prescribed for that. Uh, sometimes it's mental illness, uh, but there's usually an underlying issue that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, so I think in partnership, these things working together, these municipalities working together, um, that would address uh, the need a lot better than uh, just police being called to the scene or, or whatever. Um, as far as uh, human trafficking, uh, also a horrible, horrible thing. Um, and I agree with Mr. Clements uh, as far as uh, prosecuting uh, human trafficking, uh, identifying it and rooting it out uh, because it is, it is a form of slavery. 
Okay, Mr. Kitchens, you have uh, two minutes. In reference to uh, sex trafficking for our children, we need to criminalize all forms of human trafficking with the stiffest penalties that we can come up with. Proactively identify victims of all forms of trafficking and provide appropriate protection services for these children that are being uh, picked up after these uh, sting uh, operations. Uh, we have I-75 going to Toledo, to Detroit. So we have a, a big highway that these kids can be taken from. We need our parents uh, to make sure that our kids are not on these sites that we're talking about in reference to uh, sex talk, chat rooms, or anything like this. We need to monitor our kids. We need to let them know what's happening out there. It might be a scary thought, but it's happening out there. And we have to protect our kids. In reference to drug overdoses, drug overdoses kill more people in the United States than guns or car accidents and are the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50. Reality is the drug addiction has become the deadliest public health crisis in recent US history and funding gaps that exist between problems and solutions to address the problem will not be closed without private funding. As we get federal, state, local funding in reference to the situation, we even have to look for private funding to help us nip this in the bud and make sure that we're good in covering this situation. I do not want to defund the police departments because they're going to need that to make sure that we stay on top of it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in light of the, the time, we need to move on to the third question. And Mr. Uh, Rubley, we will, I will start with you. Uh, please explain your stance on funding for public education, including support for millage requests from schools such as uh, MCCC. Okay. Uh, appreciate the question. Um, that's what I do for my career um, in public education. Um, I teach at the uh, kindergarten through 12th grade level. Um, and education since the 90s has, funding has not uh, kept up with uh, inflation. Um, and nowadays, districts, it's not unheard of for 90% of the fund balance to be spent on uh, just salaries and benefits alone, let alone the textbooks and the uh, extra stuff that students need, such as uh, social workers, uh, psychologists, counselors. Um, so we have this situation where schools have been underfunded and they're trying to do more with less. And our needs of our kids have changed immensely. Um, not just demographic wise, but as far as mental illness, mental health needs, um, as far as uh, the number of kids that come in as a uh, kindergartner and they're not uh, emerging readers, they don't know their letters, they don't know their sounds, and they start off two steps back before they even get started. Um, so I really think we need to move forward, not just in the 56th district, uh, but as a state, and start funding preschool, uh, starting at three years old, uh, with a state-approved uh, curriculum. Uh, and then K through 12, obviously, and then also I think we need to move forward as a state and a district to uh, fund associate's degree, bachelor's degree, and or a trade certificate uh, for people that uh, after they get out of high school. Um, other nations are doing this. Uh, in Europe, it's not unheard of. Um, and we're competing on a global scale. Um, so I think we're behind uh, as far as, as education. Our education system needs a lot of reform. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Lentz, let me move to you on this question. Myself? Yes, please. Okay, sorry about that. No, I, I think one of the interesting facts that we, we want to think about when we talk about this is that this last year, the highest dollar amount in our state budget uh, has gone toward education in the history of our state. Um, during COVID, the legislature saw and recognized the obvious need, and I agree, and I'm glad they did, to ensure that education budgets were not impacted the same way others. It was protected to ensure that resources were there. The other thing is COVID has shown us that a one-size-fits-all educational program is not necessarily uh, the end-all be-all. As we're seeing, choice is 
is necessary. It's needed. Uh, we're in a world where people have different demands, students have different requirements, uh, and COVID has taught us that, in fact, different methodologies of instruction can be brought to bear in a reasonable way um, with success. We haven't mastered it by any stretch of the imagination, but at least it gives us the idea that the opportunity exists. However, our problems that we have in education, and, and to be as blunt as possible, as I think most of us would agree that Prop A doesn't work. Um, no one's happy with the results of it. We are allowing the National Department of Education to dictate what we're doing in the state, and we're teaching to the lowest common denominator until we can begin some of these cru crucial elements. And we can also allow teachers to teach again and not do everything else under the sun. We're gonna continue to wrestle with this problem. I have two children that are currently in the elementary school system, so I'm heavily invested in ensuring that we fix this to be sure that their education and all of their peers is continually improving and improving. About 30 seconds. That's it, thank you. Okay, okay, Mr. Kitchens, uh, the question is to you. Large majority of the federal funding set aside for public education is distributed directly to the local schools. The federal government does not have the authority to set unfunded mandates for the local schools, which means schools and districts can always refuse federal money offered if the state government does not wish to participate in the program these dollars are allotted to fund. Some of the programs currently funded by the federal government is Title I, a program specifically geared to students from low income families and areas which provides money to local districts to improve academic performance of these students. Possibly uh, English language acquisitions offers money to schools with students that do not speak English as a first language to help them learn English and improve proficiency on statewide examinations. Reading First programs provides federal money to help schools implement robust reading programs that utilize scientific based research to support their success. Individuals with disabilities allotted money to schools to help students with disabilities get a quality education in the public school system by providing with the resources they need to succeed. Improving seconds. teacher quality grants as well. Offers money for the teacher training and develop programs within local schools and districts. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. How about uh, final thoughts, uh, 30 seconds uh, to make one final statement, and, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Rubley. Um, yeah, just going back to education. Um, again, our, our kids' needs are changing immensely uh, right before our eyes, uh, especially with, with COVID. Um, lots more mental health issues. Uh, we have kids that with the hybrid districts that are uh, at home two days a week with maybe a parent there, maybe not a parent there, a lot of single parent households. Um, and I just, I see a mental health epidemic um, in our kids. And unfortunately, if they're not fed, if they don't have good mental health, they're not going to learn. Um, and also see the kids that come in, like I was saying, in kindergarten, and they have these deep uh, gaps uh, because they're not emergent readers and they just they start behind and those are the kids that get the title one help that Mr. Kitchens alluded to um, and a lot of times that gap is never closed uh, those kids that came in as kindergartners got got the title one they might tread water they might keep with, with the other group they never close that gap with with their uh, peer group um, we'll leave it there and, and move on to Mr. Mr. Clements 30 seconds so if you know anything about me or I ask you to remember anything, take away from this, know that I believe this. Our tax dollars, we love to talk in terms of government budget, federal dollars, state dollars. Let's make no mistake. That's our money. Our money is best spent the closer it is spent to the people. It is my belief that if we can do everything within our power to minimize and reduce the size of government, that simply allows our dollars to come back to our neighborhoods, to our schools, to our communities, where it can most directly impact us. Five I seconds. thank you for tuning in and I appreciate your vote on November 3rd or if you're considering by your absentee ballot. Great. Mr. Kitchens, 30 seconds. I appreciate what TC was saying in reference to our tax dollars, that it is our constituents 
tax dollars that are working for us. It depends on our elected officials, how they spend it and how they let the ta taxpayers know what they're spending it for. I, uh, I am looking for transparency in reference to what we do at the state level as well as the local level. I wanna make sure that our citizens know where their tax dollars is going. Five what seconds. tax dollars we already lost in reference to a roundabout. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen, I thank you for your time. Thank you. And we will move on now to the 17th district state representative. We have Christopher Slatt and Joe Bellino. And so we'll start off with uh, Mr. Slatt. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Okay, so the first question is for you. Uh, describe your plans for addressing environmental issues in our district, such as clean water and pollution. Okay, well, it's great to be here. I wanna thank everybody for putting this on. Uh, obviously, environmental issues are close to my heart. If you don't believe me, just take a look at my sign. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's more than just, right now we have so many environmental issues. Uh, obviously, we, we live on the Great Lakes. Um, water quality is extremely important and extremely under threat. Uh, and really, we have the, the threat of climate change closing in on us fast, and we really need to be uh, sure that we're ahead of that. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, we have a coal plant and, and a nuclear plant in Monroe County, um, but the coal plant, DTE Energy has said, is closing uh, by 2040. Realistically, it's probably going to close quite a bit sooner than that, or at least be idle for a long time. Uh, uh, sooner than that. So we really need to figure out what the energy economy of the future is going to look like, what the uh, clean energy future is going to look like, and how Monroe County can play a part in that. And most importantly, make sure that we have opportunity for the workers who are going to be displaced by this transition. Uh, because if we just sit back and let this happen, someone else is going to lead the way on this, and there's not going to be great opportunity for our workers. Uh, so we need to make sure that whatever comes out of this, that we get ahead of the ball, and that we're creating sustainable, good paying jobs to replace the jobs that are gonna be lost. Um, and that requires really bold leadership. And I am very frustrated that on climate change and on so many other environmental issues, uh, these have been issues that people have known about in government for decades and nothing gets done because at the end of the day, people care about their next election, they care about their next campaign donation, and they don't care about doing uh, big things with foresight uh, to really crack down on, on the issues that affect uh, all of our communities. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Mr. Bellino. Thank you. And thanks for having this forum. It's, uh, it's a lot better than the one they had four years ago, which was slightly sl uh, sided with the left wing. And the one we had two years ago, uh, there were a lot of people in the audience that were disrespectful to the sitting congressman. So this is a lot better, I appreciate it. Um, I grew up in Detroit Beach. When I was a kid, there were signs on the beach that said, swimming is hazardous to your health. So I never swam on the beach till I was 12 years old. The water was too dirty. And the, and the water was so bad at our well at the beach that we had to let the water run for at least 30 seconds to get the brown out of it before we even washed our hands. We never drank that water. We went to the closest laundromat where the city water line ended on Dixie Highway and got water there every week, 12 gallons. And that's how we lived until city water came in when I was about 10 years old. We've come a long way. We've got a long way to go though, we know that. Um, look at what's happening to Lake Erie right now with, with, uh, with uh, algae bloom. The farmers in Michigan are doing a wonderful job with MEEP, but not enough farmers are involved in MEEP. We're only at about 30% right now. We need a lot more farmers to get involved in MEEP so that we trap the nutrients before they get into the streams and get into the lake. Uh, as chairman of the Energy Committee, we've had a lot of committee meetings on EV infrastructure. We know they're coming. We've had committee meetings on solar rooftop. We're almost at the cap in large areas of the state, like UP and all of consumers areas, where people can sell the energy that they produce in their home from their solar rooftop back to the utilities. When they meet that cap, the utilities don't have to pay them. From the 2016 bill that was signed, they're almost at that cap. So we've got to change that. So we encourage more rooftop solar, not, not, not decourage it like Ann Arbor did, where when you put a rooftop solar on and they taxed you more money because you had rooftop solar. So we need to keep doing things like that. I've been working on that in the Energy Committee, and I want to keep doing that. And as far as the coal burner being shut down by 2040, I don't think it'll happen. I think it may be gas before then, because we need some backup generation. Okay, great timing. 
Uh, Mr. Slatt, how about one minute response? Well, if the, if the coal plant turns to gas, they're going to be closing down the coal plant. I mean, that's not my timeline that says it's going to close down by 2040. That's DTE's own timeline. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, but let me, let's be clear about what the issue is here. Um, we have corporate monopolies that uh, are controlling our energy policy, they're controlling energy efficiency, and they're controlling the, the legislators that we send to Lansing. Uh, and that's really the issue behind so many of our issues. We have, uh, like I said, legislators who get up there and they start taking the money. DT Energy is a huge player in state politics. The, the legislature does not uh, regulate them, they regulate the legislature. So, you know, to have a really holistic approach that's not just kicking the can down the road and saying, okay, we're gonna put a solar panel here, an electric car here, we need bigger thinking and we need to get rid of money out of politics. That's why I'm not taking corporate donations to my campaign. Okay, Mr. Bellino, you have one minute. Well, thank you. Um, you know, at being the chairman of the Energy Committee, uh, it's, it, I'm part of the solution. The Senate is there and I am there. When we have meetings on EV infrastructure, like, like myself, I went to California last year and there were charging stations everywhere. We don't have that in Michigan. Uh, also, California's got lots and lots and lots of solar. But my daughter in Santa Barbara had rolling blackouts this summer because there's no backup generation. We've got to have backup generation. I also had a meeting two weeks ago with, with consumers about what's going on here in Milan. Uh, it's gonna be a huge solar array. So we're working on, on the problems. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Bellino, uh, we'll stay with you. And yeah. second question, uh, explain how you plan to address drug addiction human tra and human trafficking in our district. Well, thank you for the question. Obviously the people who wrote the question up knew I was an addict in recovery. Um, when I first got elected, I, I was like a go-to man for people when it came to opioids and, and other issues because I have experience with this stuff. I was put on a committee right away by the governor uh, that put through a lot of good legislation dealing with opioids. Um, I met face-to-face -face with the Department of Health and Human Services chief talking about opioids, and my push was non-traditional treatment. Opioid addiction is not alcoholism. A lot of people can get sober in a short period of time when they're alcoholics. When you're addicted to pills, uh, opioid pills or heroin, it takes a little more time to reprogram the brain. So it takes a longer time in treatment and traditional treatment of six, 12, 14 days is not working. So non-traditional treatment like Apollo's house, like uh, Blue Water Recovery, like St. Joe's uh, Center of Hope uh, by the hospital. These are things that help the addict. Um, so doing things like that and, and pushing through legislation bipartisan, um, there was a Whippet problem, which is a, 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 a gas the kids were sniffing in Southwest Detroit. I, I found out about it. Somebody wanted to pass a bill. I went to judges in town, our prosecutor. No one said that we had a problem here in town. The sheriff, no one said we had a problem, but there was a problem in Southwest Detroit. So I ganged up with, with uh, Senator Chang, who was a rep then, and we passed a bill to make it illegal to sell this stuff to kids under 18. And that's just part of the things that I've been doing and that I'll continue to do things like that because right now I think I'm the only addict in recovery in the House or the Senate. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, Mr. Slatt, your question. Yeah, so when we talk about addiction and especially when we talk about opiate addiction, uh, we can't separate it from the underlying uh, economic struggles in our community. Uh, we've got a lot of workers who are doing you know, physical labor they're overworked, they don't have access to good health care, they're hurting their bodies. And when you know they feel a little pain, they don't always know that they can go to a doctor and get that treated before it becomes a bigger problem. So you have people who are injured on the job, uh, and they, you know, especially because we have a uh, for profit, you know, health insurance and for profit health care system that is again, uh, you know, largely uh, uh, doing the bidding of pharmaceutical companies. Uh, people get addicted to opiates. And so all the stuff that's been going on with recovery and law enforcement has been really good, but we need to make sure that we're improving conditions in working households to really get to the root of this problem. Just like that's what we have to do to get to the root of, of so many issues in our community. Um, so that's what I'm about. Um, you know, and, and we also have to kind of rethink, we are rethinking uh, how we're dealing with incarceration on these issues. I think more and more people are realizing that that addiction is more of a disease than a, than a crime. And so I, I look forward to continuing work on that. Uh, I, I really like to see things like drug courts popping out uh, where we can make sure these people get the help that we need. But 
uh, as I said, we really need to make sure that we are treating the underlying economic situations that are, um, are putting us in this spot to begin with. Because we're not the only community going through this. And if you look at all the communities that are going through this sort of thing, they all have economic uh, issues, uh, worker issues uh, in their history or, or in, in their present. Okay, so let's stay with you for the final question. Uh, please explain your stance on funding for public education, including support for millage requests from schools such as MCCC. Okay, well, first of all, I, uh, I absolutely support the millage request. Um, I work in education. I work for the Monroe County Intermediate School District, which means uh, I don't just serve one school, I serve all the schools in Monroe County. So I, I get around and I see uh, what happens when you have schools that are funded really, really well, uh, very equitably and adequately. I also see what happens, you know, when, when they're not. Um, and so, you know, we really need to make sure that we're treating school funding seriously because year after year, it seems like schools have to go up there and beg for money. And they, the legislature, you know, is, it likes to use the school uh, aid fund, you know, to plug other holes or play games. Obviously, there's a big corporate privatization agenda happening with education in Lansing, more of that corporate control I'm talking about. Uh, so we really need to push back on that. Uh, if I'm elected, I want to see schools getting fully funded. I want to make sure that teachers are getting paid fairly because I have friends. I have teacher friends who have either moved districts or left the profession because uh, they have so many behavioral issues in their classroom, which again comes from the underlying economic conditions in our community. But, uh, you know, they don't have the time or the energy to deal with all the issues that are not education, directly education related in their classrooms. So they're saying, you know, we're not getting paid. We're going to move to maybe a wealthier district. And that just creates more uh, inequities and inequalities in the system. Uh, you know, we only have w about one school counselor, I think, for every 750 students in the state right now. So there's a whole bunch of support services that need to be better funded, especially now with COVID-19 when everything's changing so much. And when, uh, you know, I, I, students are going to have some serious uh, issues out of this, mental issues, I think, from, from some of the stress uh, and hardships that this has been causing on everybody. Okay, okay great. Mr. Bellino, same question. Yes, I'm happy that I voted the last four years on record funding for schools, and we kind of took the governor's uh, charge the last couple of years and, and worked with her and got it worked out. It wasn't uh, for-profit schools that were doing the school budget. It was the governor with the Senate and the House. We've got great schools in Monroe County. We're lucky. Um, we've got only two charter schools in Monroe County as opposed to Wayne, which I think has 45 or 50 charter schools. So we've got great public schools. The problem is uh, there was a, a study done a couple years ago said we're a couple billion short in funding schools and they're correct, but the couple billion got to go to the right school districts. It can't keep going to the Groziels and the West Bloomfields and, and areas up there where they're, where they're getting 12, $13,000 a student. Do you know in Groziel right now, the top teacher pay scale is $98,000. And I'm betting right now nobody in Monroe is within 15 grand of that. And that's stupid because we're doing the same job at Grosse Hill or Whiteford or Somerville or Monroe or Jefferson. We're doing the same job. But the funding's been inadequate. Now, Snyder tried for years to increase the funding for the poor schools. They did for six straight years, but we're still almost a thousand dollar gap between, on, on, the, on the allowance for the rich schools and the poor schools. So the gap's got to be leveled out. Um, also, I think that charter schools is not the silver bullet. It helps some people, but it's not the silver bullet. It's part of the answer, but it's not the complete answer. Uh, we need more funding for schools and equitable funding for schools. Okay, let's stay with you for 30 seconds. Uh, final thoughts. My final thoughts? Yes, please. Well, thank you. I will be voting for the Monroe MCCC Millage. I was happy to be on the board when it was put on the ballot last time, and I helped walk for that, and I gave Kojo money for the fund that bought signs and stuff, so I'll be there 100%. Um, as you see, I'm just a blue collar worker guy. I go to work every day. Uh, a lot of my district is rural. Sumter, London, Berlin, uh, Exeter, Ash, these are rural areas. So I, I, I represent all the people in my district and I go to, I drive up every day, drive home, do my work. And, and that's what it's all about. Doing what the people want, take care of business. So thank you for the opportunity. Excellent. Okay, Mr. Slatt, uh, final thoughts, 30 seconds. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I think about the reason I'm running, it's because I think we have a system in Lansing that simply isn't working for ordinary people. That's what public service means to me. Uh, you know, not only doing what you can for your community, but doing what you can to represent people who aren't like you. That's why I'm running. I'm not taking any corporate money into my campaign, no industry pack money, because I think we all understand that big money, corporations, industry controls Lansing up there. And that's why we have so many problems that we have. Okay, excellent. So I just checked with my colleagues and we have not received any questions for the state representatives in the chat yet. So I will keep you posted if we do. Uh, but for now, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we will move on to the District 5 County Commissioner race. We have Bill Lavoy and Randy Richard Bill. Hello. Hi, guys. Okay. Hi, Bill. So I can see you. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. Okay, here we go. We'll start, we'll start with uh, Mr. Lavoie. Uh, again, we have three questions for you guys. Uh, the first one, uh, please describe the commission's role in fostering partnerships locally, statewide, and on the federal level to help in terms of redevelopment, sparking new development, and building back following the pandemic. Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank um, the community college for hosting this and also um, say that I have already voted for the millage. Um, I've already voted and dropped off my ballot at uh, the city clerk's office. Um, so again, thank you and I support the millage and uh, I, I think it's important, education is an important piece of, of people's success. So um, I think the commission's role in economic development is by trying to work with the different entities that exist in the city um, and the county and all the townships and all the governmental units that make up Monroe County um, to try to identify um, opportunities for business and, and opportunities for jobs. So I plan to work with the Port of Monroe, the Monroe County Business Development Corporation, the Chamber of Commerce, local nonprofits, small and large businesses, labor organizations, the local governments as well as state and federal governments and the educational institutions to identify business opportunities and identify potential growth for our community. Um, I've been talking earlier about uh, diversifying um, some of the economic opportunities we have um, and trying to stimulate economic development. Uh, we're, we're still an area that's dependent on jobs in, in a few sectors and I'd like to see some diversity in some of that. Um, I also think we need to upgrade public infrastructure and that's where the county can help with funding some of the roads through the County Road Commission to kind of upgrade the roads and other types of infrastructures and helping to coordinate um, some of the road projects as well as any kind of uh, financial incentives that can be given to uh, businesses through possible tax abatements and that kind of thing. That's my answer. Excellent, perfect timing. Mr. Richardville, same question. Well, thank you. And, you know, uh, I think the fact that Monroe County Community College is hosting this is just one of the many um, examples of how they are a community college and not just an educational institution. I, I actually took political science there many years ago. And I think most of you know that I was involved a lot in the Meyer Center, the Lazy Boy Theater and the Meyer Center, um, as, as well as the science and technology uh, building when I was in office. And I agree with Mr. Lavoie about infrastructure being a part of economic development. In fact, uh, then Governor John Engler back in 1999 came down to Monroe um, to sign my tax bill, which is the first tax cut for Michigan citizens in I don't know how many years, but while he was here, we negotiated the tail end of the Cabela's building coming into Monroe County. And you may or may not know that Monroe County is the number one tourism destination in the state of Michigan, largely because of Cabela's, over a million visitors a year. And we negotiated fixing and making all the entrance ramps and all that had to do with 23, the hub of the highway up there. But more importantly than that um, was the work that I did, significant work here in the 5th District while I was in office. In my very first term, uh, I attained funding to clean up polluted grounds uh, where there was a Jefferson Smurfit property 
and then the underground contamination of uh, what is now the Mason Run development. Uh, one of those became a national state park or national park. I worked with Congressman Dingle and uh, United States Senator Levin to get that complete. But the initial funding to clean up the polluted area was my baby. And the same thing with what is now Mason Run. When I was the, the director of economics at the Port of Monroe, we significantly uh, did some significant work in attracting a company called Ventower Industries. It created over 100 jobs. And we did that through working with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Uh, the other major, do we have something? I'm sorry? We'll have to leave it there and move on to the next okay. question last time. Right. Uh, but we'll stay with you uh, for question number two. Uh, okay. Please describe the top issues facing the county. Well, the obvious would be that we have a pandemic going on and we have economic development uh, you know, being thwarted. Uh, more importantly, the economic development part of it, of course, is the safety and security of our people, especially our most vulnerable, our children and our senior citizens, those with pre-existing conditions. Um, working with uh, the, the state government, uh, here's, here's an issue that I think has been highlighted during this epidemic, uh, during this pandemic rather, and, and that is that uh, the state government seems to have an awful lot of power versus that of the counties. Uh, over the last 20 or so years, many other states have reduced the power of the state government, giving some of that power and funding back to the counties where they took the funding. So why do we have to continually send our money to Lansing and have them redistribute it to places uh, besides Monroe County? Um, and, and that's one reason why I want to be on the county board is so that I can take that message to Lansing, because unlike the United States uh, Constitution, we are totally population driven. And the three big counties in Michigan, and that would be Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb, have nearly half the population. And the, the governor's uh, race, the, the Michigan Senate and the Michigan House of Representatives are all population based. So I, I think that the voices of the people of Monroe County should be heard louder and clearer and we should be more responsible to have our own money in our own pockets spending it the way we think is best. Uh, we also have some significant economic issues potentially coming with the decommission of the de decommissioning of the nuclear power plant and the tax base there. Um, I worked obviously in in the, the city of Detroit through the uh, their bankruptcy. I was directly involved in helping them come out of bankruptcy. While we also protected uh, pensions uh, for the people that were had lost them at that point. Okay, excellent. Okay, Mr. Lavoy, same question. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, to to kind of talk about what I did for the four short years that I was in Lansing, um, I was really fighting for local control like Randy was talking about. Um, I, I, I don't wanna knock him on some of this stuff, but um, he was Senate Majority Leader for four years and it didn't seem like a lot of the stuff that he was doing actually talked about local control. So as far as the issues um, is the, the, of Monroe County that, that we will face and counties face in general, I think the pandemic is one of them for sure. Um, the ensuing economic shutdown, which is due to the pandemic, is an issue. And the reevaluation of the taxable value of the two remaining power plants in the area, those are going to have far reaching negative effects on revenue. And I think that when that happens, we need to protect essential services and uh, pension funding. Um, there, there's a state law that says that if your pension funding falls below a certain level, um, that the state then comes in and can make a lot of the moves um, as far as the pension board goes and decide what to do with the pension fund. So I think we do need to look at protecting pensions. Um, I also, as I said earlier, I think we need to continue with upgrading public infrastructure. Um, I know that's gonna be hard in a negative revenue situation, uh, but I think we need to continue to invest in some, some of that and hopefully uh, make Monroe County a place where people want to live and work and where people want to locate businesses. So I think those are all important pieces of, uh, of, of the whole economic puzzle and how we try to make Monroe County um, attractive to 
want people to live here and work here, as I said earlier. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. So we've, we've covered a good amount of ground here. I want to give you guys a chance to respond. Uh, Mr. Richardville, uh, one minute for response. Yeah, well, with all due respect, I already do love this area and I do want to live here. I have been living here for a vast majority of my life. And I think a lot of businesses have located here. And one of the things we have to be careful of is that we don't do a whole lot of economic fishing. And that is going out and trying to find a, a businesses to come here, um, fishing and hunting versus uh, economic gardening, where we take care of those that we have. A lot of them are struggling right now. And if you probably know I was, was the Small Business Association of Michigan Legislator of the Year helped to redefine the entire tax structure for small businesses back around 2010 or so. Um, and I, I also want to mention what I ran out of time with the first one is that, you know, the Lazy Boy headquarters here in our district uh, has 500 jobs. And I worked with the leadership of that company to go to Lansing to meet with the MEDC and to get a multi-million dollar grant to keep those 500 jobs and that investment here in Monroe. I don't just talk about economic development, I have a history of doing it. Excellent, Mr. Lavoie, uh, one minute. Um, I, I would say that I still think it's important um, for small businesses too, besides the larger ones. We've seen the effects of changes of ownership of companies in our area, specifically First Merchants Bank, which is now headquartered out of Indiana, um, instead of the, the local control that it used to have with the local board of directors, it now has one director. So I think we need to also look at things to do and help small businesses. Um, you had talked about Small Business Association of Michigan. At one point in time, I was also supported by them. Um, and some of that is due to uh, trying to figure out the 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 say in some of the energy policy things that I was working on after you were gone, um, Randy. But I, I think you, we, don't, we don't wanna forget the big things are wonderful and it's wonderful to do all the big things. But to me, small businesses are the backbone of our economy and we need to have local regulations that are beneficial to small businesses. Okay. If I might, might add something here. Real, real quick. Uh, Yes, Mr. Lavoie and I have known each other a long time. We've known our families have known each other for a long time. And unlike what you see happening in Washington, sometime in Lansing, I think there's a mutual respect for each other. So uh, I, I do want to say that that is something that Monroe County should be proud of is that we do have people that can disagree and not be disagreeable. And I congratulate him on his candidacy. Mr. Lavoie, a couple seconds. Um, I agree with Randy on that. And I think, you know, any kind of negative campaigning that would come out of this, and I haven't seen any yet. Um, I hope it doesn't happen. And I know you can't control what other people do. Um, but I, I also have respect for what Randy has done. He's had the, the been very fortunate in being in, in state government for 14 years. I was only for four and he was in the majority the whole time and I was in the minority the whole time, it makes it much harder to do things, um, especially when you have people that aren't willing to work with you uh, and you're not in the majority. So you don't have the votes, you don't have the power. So it makes it a little bit harder. It's not an excuse, it's just the way things work and how our political system works. Gotcha, let's stay with you. Final question. Uh, this year, the pandemic, uh, economic and racism crises have deeply hurt many communities you, you represent. How do you plan to lead our region to recovery and growth? What do we need to do and who do we need to focus on? So I think initially with some of this is some of what Randy actually mentioned, and it's about having respect for other people uh, and, and their opinions. I, I may disagree with some of the policies that, that Randy has done in the 14 years he was in state government. Um, he may disagree with the ones that I was supporting and voted for or voted against. Uh, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where we need to listen more. Um, I think that transparency in government will help with some of this. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to combat people that, or, or how to talk with people that are combative right, whether it's through social media or whatever, you try to be nice, you don't put them down, you don't post memes that make fun of them. I think that kind of devalues people's opinions. And I think people just wanna be heard. And even though they might be polar opposites, um, I, I think that's something that needs to happen. 
and I will listen and work with um, both sides of the aisle, or if there's more than the two political parties that end up getting elected, or people that represent third parties, and try to listen to some of their concerns. Um, I think that we obviously still have a, a problem with some institutional racism in, uh, in our country and this area, and I think we need to do some things to fix that problem. Um, and again, I think listening will go a long way towards that. Um, I also would hope for a possible expansion of the Elliot Larson uh, Act, which there were discussions my first two years in office while, while Randy was the uh, Senate Majority Leader of trying to do a dual religious freedom and rep recreation um, and rep reparation act. Sorry, I'm saying it wrong. Restoration Act, Religious Freedom and Restoration Act. It was called RIFRA. And the second piece of that was to also increase um, uh, gender identity and put that into Elliot Larson as a protected uh, class. So, um, you know, hopefully at the county level, I don't know what we can do about that. Maybe do like they're doing in Jackson County and uh, have an ad hoc committee at the county level to see what needs to be done as far as um, people that feel like they're not being heard or they're being marginalized in this community. Okay, moving on, Mr. Richardville. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question from a policy standpoint. I don't, I don't see a whole lot that county government can do to uh, fight against what, what we're talking about here. The, the best thing that I can say is that you have to lead by example. Um, you know, I, I was most embarrassed uh, for the country, uh, as well as um, my party and the, the other party with the way the first debate went. And, and the idea that we can continue to treat people in leadership positions with disrespect, especially back and forth to each other, is uh, an embarrassing thing. I got a phone call from a friend of mine in Australia the other day who said that during the day, they, he and a bunch of other people, these are prominent businessmen, they, they tape Michigan, or excuse me, United States politics, and they watch it for entertainment at night. And that's not the kind of example we want to set for the rest of the world. But at the county level, we have to do it at least by example within the people that we work with here in the county. Um, the, the, what concerns me the most is the young people that are watching TV, the young people that are watching adults call, uh, you know, call elected uh, officials names and, and that kind of thing. I just don't have any, any time or respect for it. Um, in my very first campaign, uh, I really considered why I would run for office. And the, the, the most important thing I said at that point, I got this ad from late 1990s, said the most important job of a state representative is to listen. And I went around to literally thousands of doors and knocked on, on doors and asked people what was important to them, uh, what they wanted us to work on, what they thought they weren't being heard about, et cetera. I was knocking on doors today in uh, uh, Riverside Manor uh, area, knocking on doors and talking to people and asking them what they were concerned about. Um, I think Bill's right. I think the idea of listening is the number one thing, uh, but not just listening, you have to act on it too. And then again, lead by example. People look to you to see how you're going to act. And if you're not acting like an adult, why should they? Okay. I think we have some questions for you all. Uh, Dan, are you there? Maybe. Dan or Cole? Well, all right, sorry, fellas. Well, if you guys could stay, uh, stay on, stay online, um, I might come back to you uh, with those questions, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. 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 So for now, we have to move on to the next race. We, we spent a lot of time here, and I really appreciate it, guys. Um, Okay, so we're moving on to District 8, and we need to talk with Greg Moore. Hello, how are you? Hi, good. I'm not seeing your, your picture yet, but let me go, I can hear you, so let me go ahead and ask you uh, your question. First question. Oh, there you are. Okay. okay. 
Please describe the commission's role in fostering partnerships locally, statewide, and on the federal level to help in terms of redevelopment, sparking new development, and building back following the pandemic. That's actually a, a great question because not only is a county commissioner the conduit between the resident and the constituent and local government, but we really act in a role as a conduit between local municipalities such as townships and villages and then also with state and federal government, which was one of the reasons in 2017 when the Trump administration reached out to me and said, hey, why don't you come down to the White House, talk with some secretaries and cabinet members, and we want your input on how federal laws are affecting your local government. Uh, I went down to the White House in 2017. I was one of 22 people to show up because they thought it was a joke, uh, the people who got the invite because no administration had ever done that. And we sat for two days and we talked to cabinet members and undersecretaries about how federal and state regulations and laws are affecting the local government. I went back in 2019 as well, invited back a second time. And uh, a lot more people showed up that time because they realized it was the, it was the real deal. But when I came back from there, I came back with contact information. I came back with resources. I have people in federal departments on speed dial that I've actually called and used to help with constituent issues. And I think that was a great example of how a local uh, county commission can help, you know, kind of connect those gaps between village, township, state, federal, county, all those local departments. So I think it's vitally important that uh, county commissioners are connected there. I was a legislative liaison in Lansing for a few years. Um, I also uh, on good terms with many of the state representatives and first name basis with senators and things like that. And just like Randy Richardville uh, said, you know, we have a connection there with the state and even with the federal. There's some laws that they make in Lansing that directly affect my constituents here in the county. And you have to make sure to foster those relationships and, that, and do the absolute best that we can do for our residents here in Monroe County. Thank you. Perfect time. Mm. Okay, uh, next question. Please describe the top issues facing the county. Yeah, another good question. I think it's economic. I really do. And when you look at what's happened over the last eight months with COVID-19, I think it's more important now than ever that we have, uh, we're making wise decisions on our county, county budget. Um, I can tell you that we are in great fiscal shape in Monroe County because over the last four years on, on my tenure on the board, and even before that, we had both Democrats and Republicans making wise decisions with taxpayer money. We've increased the bond rating, we've increased services, we put more deputies back on the road. We've balanced the budget. We've given more uh, money to senior citizens. Uh, and we did all that while never raising any taxes. And, and we also did that um, you know, while also increasing our uh, rainy day fund. We actually gave out bonuses this year to first line workers for all those inv involved in COVID-19. Now, how were we able to do that? Because we used wisdom and discernment when setting that budget. We have full-time grant writers looking for grants that we can acquire and we can use. Uh, the sheriff's office does a phenomenal job at finding those grants at the federal level and making sure that we're using them here in the county. So I would say it's economic, but I would also say that uh, due to what we've done on the board over the last four, six, seven, eight years, we're in a position now to where not only are we uh, uh, fiscally sound, but we're in a position to where we're doing a full overhaul of employee benefits and, and, uh, and payments because we can't. Uh, because we know that things like COVID will happen. We know that when we go out and purchase a half a million dollars worth of pumps for our coastline communities, we have to budget wisely so that we can do that when those emergency things come up. So I think it's going to be economic in nature. And I think we can build on that foundation that we've done over the last four to six years and, and see us through this next issue that we call COVID. Thank you. Okay, great. And your final question, uh, this year, the pandemic, economic and racism crises have deeply hurt many communities you are, represent. How do you plan to lead the region to recovery and growth? What do we need to do and who do we need to focus on? That, that's a great question as well. You know, um, I think it goes back to the previous question. I think there is an economic outlier there that we always have to um, look at. Uh, obviously the county commission is very budgetary in nature. But I think it goes back to actually what both Bill and Randy were talking about. Uh, when we're talking about constituents, um, you have to realize that first and foremost, 
as a Christian and a presuppositionalist, which just is a fancy theological term that says I presuppose everything in the Bible is true, uh, and that it's in the inspired word of God, it says that every single human is an image bearer of God, which means they have inherent value. We see that even in our Constitution, the very first words, all men created equal, endowed with inalienable rights from our creator. It was a revolutionary idea. And I've lived by that in both my public and private life. As a real estate broker, I help all kinds of clients across socioeconomic status, uh, sexual identity, uh, age, marriage status, right? And I treat them with respect and dignity because they are image bearers of God and they, and they deserve that. When I work on the county commission, every single person uh, that calls me obviously deserves my uh, respect, but also I help them because that's what I was elected to do. You know, I was really hoping to get that first question uh, because I love the fact that you guys put public service in there. We're calling it elected officials and politicians. It is public service. I work for the uh, residents and the constituents of this county. I work for them and I serve at their pleasure. So it doesn't matter wh where they come from, uh, what they look like, how they talk, how much money they make. I'm there to serve them because they hired me. Thank you. Okay. So that's all the questions. So I want to give you uh, 30 seconds for a final, uh, final comments. Final thoughts? Oh, I thought maybe I would get a minute to rebut myself on every question. <laughs> if you want. Oh, no, I, can't. I don't think I'd want to do that. Uh, final questions is I think uh, I appreciate the uh, Monroe County Community College uh, hosting this. This is such a cool event for you guys to get out and to uh, have us out there so we can talk to constituents, talk to voters. An educated electorate is the best kind that we can have. Um, and I, continue, and I want to continue working hard for the residents of Monroe County. This is something I'm passionate about. I don't do it for a title. I don't do it for accolades. I definitely don't do it for the money. I do it because I love my community, and I want to see it be a good place to work, play, and live. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Good timing there. Okay, so uh, we do have some questions for, uh, let's see here, uh, Mr. Bellino and Mr. Slat. Are you guys still online? I am. Okay, was that? that yes. Was flat. Right. Okay, excellent. Uh, so here's the question, and I'll and I'll start with uh, Mr. Slat here, and then we'll, and then Mr. Bellino. Uh, both of you guys will have uh, one minute here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this came over the chat. Um, I'm supposed to ask about the deciding votes Joe cast to give charter schools a share of local millages passed sure. to support public schools. Charter schools are not transparent with their funding as public schools are required to be. So, is, that, is, is that a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to give you both a chance. So we'll start with what's actually Mr. You, you, you want me to go first? Yes, I can please. go first. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So I believe all parents deserve a, cho deserve a choice. Poor parents and rich parents. I was lucky. I was privileged enough to go to Monroe Catholic Central. Now I worked summers for three years to pay half my tuition. And all my brothers went to Monroe High, but that's what I wanted to do, so that's what I had to do. People in the cities don't have a choice. They don't have the money. They don't have, they don't have the wherewithal to go to a Catholic or a Lutheran school. So that's part of what I liked. Second, what I liked about it was that it gave more money to the ISD students. This millage we have in Monroe, this tech millage, gives no money to the ISD students. And if you've been to the ISD, like my opponent works, they use tons of tech, but they get none of that money. Three. Another reason I like this is because it wasn't going to take effect until another millage was passed. No money goes to, IS, uh, to charter schools unless they pass another millage. Uh, next month, Wayne County is going to have their millage on the ballot again. And the fourth reason I liked it was because uh, besides people getting a choice, the ISD students, and, and it not starting up right away, is that it's unfair for poor kids not to get the same advantage as kids in rural areas that have good schools. So, thank you. Okay, Mr. Slat, one minute. Yeah, I mean, as, as Joe said, I work for the Monroe County ISD. No one at the Monroe County ISD asked for that bill. No one at the Monroe County ISD supported that bill. Um, it was a bad bill, but let's talk about charter schools and, and school choice. I believe in school choice. I went to private school actually through the first seven years, uh, through seventh grade of my academic career. Then I went to public school, Monroe Middle School, Monroe High School, and then the community college. I'm a big supporter in school choice, but when we have charter schools, we got to make sure that they're run truly as nonprofits, that they're accountable to the community, and that they're not just thinly veiled financial products for huge corporations that are trying to privatize education and take money out of public schools. Because whether you send your child to a 
private school or a public school, you are better off living in a community that has a strong basis of public education. And that's what we're losing the more and more of these corporate education privateers get into Lansing. Excellent. Okay. Hey, there's one more thing I missed here. Can I add one more thing? Yeah, how about 10 seconds? Uh, they can't get the money for these special uh, millages unless they have an accredited program for special needs kids. If they don't have that program at a, at a, at a charter school, they can't get this money. Mr. Thank Slatt? You. Yeah, I mean, that, that uh, concedes the point that there's a lot of charter schools that don't have those programs, and that's part of the problem with charter schools. Okay, we, we need to move on to the next race. I really got, appreciate you guys sticking around and, and answering. Uh, we're, we're moving on to Bedford Township Supervisor uh, Paul Perone. Is it Peroni? Perone? Am I saying that wrong? Peroni. Peroni. And Stephanie Zarb. Mr. Peroni, are yeah, you there? Mr. Peroni. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I knew I was going to mess it up. I had to ask. So. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so. I'll be the last. <laughs> got you. All right, you have the first question here. Um, okay, so this year, the pandemic, economic, and racism crises have deeply hurt many communities you represent. How do you plan to lead our region to recovery and growth? What do we need to do, and who do we need to focus on? Well, this pandemic has affected everyone in some way, shape, or form. Uh, whether you got sick, uh, a loved one died, lost a job, had to shut down a business, um, it just showed that we need to make changes to the region. We need to come together. Uh, we need to, to work together uh, the best we can. And that is something Bedford Township always has and always will do. We come together uh, in times of need. Um, we've done it time and time again. Uh, I plan to continue working with the BDC, the uh, Business Development Corporation. Um, they've got a great team of people over there to continue to, to bring people into Bedford. Uh, we're looking at property to possibly move forward for an industrial park um, off Stearns Road. Uh, we need to continue those partnerships, continue working with SEMCOG, Southeastern Michigan Council of Governments, to look for grants and different opportunities to help these businesses. That's what we did in downtown Temperance uh, with the grant we received. We brought life to that area, and we can continue to do that and continue to work together with the great agencies we have great work partnerships and relationships with. Okay. Excellent. So uh, same question, Ms. Zarb. Thank you so much for having me. I'd like to start by saying that 2020 has certainly been a year like no other in our lives. And it, I was kind of thinking about this and I, a quote from Benjamin Franklin came to mind, which is by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Uh, currently as a township, we have single year plans, but I feel strongly we need to move beyond this to multi-year planning. The truth is no one fully understands what the economic fallout from COVID is going to be but township leadership in the next four years is gonna be challenged like no other board. And it's important that we have a strong leader who understands budgeting and the financial impact crises can have on municipalities. I've spent the last decade preparing for this challenge. As a research assistant and PhD candidate, I've worked on several different projects which look at municipalities. I've interviewed municipal leaders, looked at municipal budgets, and created complex models to determine what makes municipalities successful in recovering from crisis. As a nonprofit leader, I learned how to write grants, how to stretch budget dollars, and how to communicate about money. Putting all this experience together, I have developed a plan, which includes working with our planning commission to update our master plan. Our master plan sets our priorities as a township, but most importantly, it's the residents' opportunity to tell municipal leadership what they want. The spirit of a general law township is that we are supposed to represent and reflect the will of the people. How can we do that if we're choosing not to listen to them? I also believe we need a multi-year budget, which will tell us what we can afford, and we need a capital improvement budget, which is something we currently don't have, but desperately need to understand the upcoming financial challenges. Once we have a clear picture of where we stand and where we want to go, we can write grants to help afford the things we want. I have a proven track record of grant writing, and um, as a township, our clerk and our fire chief have, are, all, are also doing a great job of grant writing, uh, often even writing grants for other departments. But I think we could do better if we had a better process. And I don't really have to imagine that. I actually know we can do it better because I've seen municipalities who have better processes and we can have a better process as well. I also want to note that I don't think our country has ever been more divided than it is right now. We need leaders who are willing to listen to all community members and not leaders who are willing to block, ban, and bully those with whom they disagree. This means listening to all residents and respecting their views, and that's what I'm committed to. Okay, so let's stay with you for this next question. 
Uh, we're kind of moving down this list. I know you guys had uh, maybe a different set of questions, uh, but the last one on the list, if, after this one, we have a lot of questions that have come through chat that I need to get to. Um, what hey, do you- Real quick though, I'm sorry. we get to rebuttal though for the question? Uh, do you want to- I'd like to rebuttal. Uh, you want a response for this one? Yes, please. Let's go for it. Okay, Th how about 30 seconds? Okay, so the good thing is, is most of what she mentioned is being done. The capital improvement plan, we've been working on that for five, six months. This board has worked very hard with the past three and a half years with volunteerism, saving $150,000 roughly on buildings and grounds. Uh, capital improvement plan is exactly what we need to do and we are doing it. Uh, it's almost in place. As far as our budget, we have worked so hard to cut nearly a million dollars off of our budget without cutting services. Absolutely. So we have done a great job of this and we'll continue to do a great job of it. So. Ms. Arb, 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I agree. We have a, a capital improvement plan that we've started, but it's actually a plan to develop a plan. So it, it hasn't actually been yet, done yet. And as I understand it, we also don't have uh, the money encumbered to actually create a capital improvement budget. So it hasn't really been a priority. And also, you know, we're required by our, our township to have a multi-year budget. We just haven't done that. So I'm not really sure how we can talk about what our future looks like if we don't have a really clear, clear picture of where we're at right now. And that's kind of why I, I was a little concerned with our spending. Um, I know last year we spent 6.1 million. This year our, our budget's 4.5 million. It might be more than that. We don't know what's gonna happen with state shared revenue. So when we talk about we've cut a million dollars, um, we did take quite a bit of money out of our road, uh, road improvement line, but I'm, I'm not sure that as a resident, I've seen a real clear plan to move forward. Well, we'll have to leave it there. And okay, so now on to our, our, our question here. What do you see as Bedford's strengths? Uh, what makes it uniquely positioned to be resilient during these difficult times? And Ms. Zarb. Okay, thank you. So I think our greatest asset and certainly our biggest strength is the residents of Bedford Township. In tough times, strong leaders bring the community together to work as a team. And in the course of my research, I've found that municipalities, which make more of an effort to bring their community together to face problems and make tough choices, also come up with the most innovative solutions. One example is from a small town in Texas where a retired engineer was able to develop a whole new system to divert stormwater. And this innovation saved the entire town during Hurricane Harvey. And to this day, they remain the only small town in Texas using this particular system. This is just one of many examples of what we are likely missing out on by excluding rather than including residents and by not updating our master plan. Now more than ever, we need to work together to make sure our neighbors, our friends and family members are getting through these challenging times and improving. The position of supervisor in Bedford Township is not about one person. The position is about the residents, our business owners, and visitors to our amazing community. There is no one size fits all answer to navigating what's coming ahead. But it is important that through our residents and working together, we can face these difficult times side by side, doing whatever it takes to make sure we come through stronger than ever as a community. Okay, excellent. Mr. Prone. Well, as always, uh, Bedford Township comes together uh, when times are difficult. Uh, it's been proven time and time again. Uh, Bedford has seen a lot of losses, children, natural disasters, and we will get through COVID. Uh, we have a good business base and people who are willing to volunteer to get things done. Um, you know, we just uh, have so many strengths within our community uh, and we're uniquely positioned. Um, you, know, um, you know, we just have uh, so many assets. Uh, we have volunteers to get things done, and uh, we will continue to do that. Okay, doke. All right. Um, okay, so on to our chat questions. We've got quite a few here. Uh, the first one, um, Ms. Peroni, we'll, we'll stay with you. Um, one of Bedford Township's elected leaders has consistently posted controversial memes that many have felt were racist, misogynistic, and generally degrading toward uh, different groups of people. What, if any, is the role of the township supervisor and board in engaging and representing the community regarding such issues? Well, the Constitution affords the, you know, free speech. Um, elected officials in their private time can do whatever they please. Um, you know, there is consequences for that, though. Uh, if the people don't like what you're saying and what they're doing, they have an opportunity to unelect you. Um, and, you know, that's what I have to say about that. Okay, Ms. Arb. So 
So this is certainly a, a difficult subject and an emotional one. Um, as a cadet in Air Force ROTC, I would remember I was on campus one day in my uniform and I was actually um, attacked by some uh, uh, war protesters. And that was a really difficult day for me. Um, but in its aftermath, I confided, I confided in a friend of mine that I didn't think the protesters had the right to be on campus. And she reminded me as a cadet and future military officer, it was my job to protect the right to free speech and not block it. And on that day, I was really frustrated by that response. But years later, I did find myself traveling to and fighting in countries where free speech was not protected. And the ramifications of not having free speech are paramount. There is nothing that makes me more proud to be an American than having lived, fought, and seen places where citizens don't have these rights. I've also spent a lot of those years working alongside members of foreign nations, which do not have a whole lot of respect for women. I've been in some really tough situations, and I found that regardless of disagreements, we can find common ground and Excellent. common goals and ways to work together. As a nation, we are divided right now and politics are ugly, but I believe the way forward is to elect leaders who are willing to work with everyone and reach across the aisle. Here in Bedford Township, we are neighbors and we are Bedford strong. Okay, Ms. Arbu, I need to stay with you on this one. Um, I've, been re I've received several comments that um, you are relatively new to town, to the community, and so I ask both of you, please describe your qualifications to serve as township supervisor. Absolutely. So I am relatively new to the community. I've been very open about that. Um, and I certainly uh, didn't move here to, to run for, for public office. I was asked to run for public office. And when I really started digging into our township budget, just based on my professional experience, I've reviewed over 2000 different municipal budgets. I've been able to interview municipal leaders all over the state of Michigan. And I did see some, some room for improvement. And as I started to really kind of dig into the budget and to ask questions, and I ended up having to, to FOIA or request a lot of information from the township, uh, it became clear that there was, there was significant room for improvement. So I decided to, um, to go ahead and, and run for office. I also spent four years running a nonprofit here in Michigan. I have a really great uh, track record of grant writing. I've brought in 2.5 million in grants. So I also believe that I have a lot to offer in terms of understanding that. I've worked extensively with FEMA on FEMA grants and that granting process and identifying what makes municipalities more, and less, more or less successful in applying for grants. About As a township, seconds. oh, I'm sorry, is that time? Seconds. Go ahead. Oh, um, okay. As a township, we do have a grant writing committee, but they actually haven't been very successful at bringing in money. Uh, but our fire chief has brought in over 300,000 this year alone. It might be up to 600,000. And our clerk, Trudy Hirschberger, has written over four grants this year, including one for the ordinance department. Um, so I think that we, and additionally, there is the Lewis Avenue Redevelopment Committee, which, was a, which did the $260,000 grant for downtown temperance. So we have a start, but I think we can do better. Great. Mr. Peroni, same question. What was the question again? Um, good question. Let me find it again. Um, oh, your, qualif your qualifications, your experience uh, for, for the office. Okay, so my qualifications and experience, um, I started out uh, from park board. I served four years to understand how the parks are operated and run. And then I was elected tre uh, trustee to where I served four years as a trustee, understanding the budget, how it works, attending budget meetings. I served four years on planning uh, to understand economic development, how rezoning works, how uh, a plan goes from start to finish. And then I took all that knowledge and I was able to run for township supervisor and be successful. And throughout that, um, we've been able to work on capital improvement plans, budgets. Um, I work with our township board every single year with about 10 meetings to get a budget put together that we ultimately approve. Uh, we do an amazing job with that and we save a lot of money. Uh, with roads, we've been able to fix all of our roads uh, without taxing the residents. We've been able to utilize that. Uh, and our spending down, what uh, people keep talking about, it was plants uh, down spending to where we didn't have to go to the residents for, for money. We just uh, utilized the money we had and we're frugal with it. And, and that's why we have the best roads in the county. Okay. Let's, let's stay with you. I've got another question in chat. Uh, how do you feel about the county sheriff contract or are you in favor of a township police department? I think our, uh, our sheriff's department does an amazing job. Um, we love our local county uh, sheriff officers. Um, you know, in the beginning when I first ran, I, I told the community when I was campaigning that uh, I would do a study to see uh, what was the best option for Bedford. Um, and throughout the study, it was, uh, it was clear that we needed to keep what we had. Um, and like I said, they, they, do, they do a great job and I appreciate 
the work they do. I've actually partnered with the school system to have a liaison officer uh, in another one of the schools, um, which makes our schools safer. And I plan to continue that relationship. Okay, Ms. Ms. Arb, do you need me to uh, re-ask the question? No, I, I, uh, I actually had the opportunity to do a police ride along yesterday and it was uh, very eye opening. And I really appreciated the fact that our, um, that our, our sheriff's deputies uh, were willing to do that for me. And I got to see firsthand what um, our deputies do every day, putting their lives on the line for us. One thing I was really concerned about is when their healthcare costs increase, and granted that was, it was a tough situation, there was a suggestion made that we put a post-it note in the budget and deal with it later. And I was really alarmed by that because I think it shows a little bit of a lack of respect for what these people do every day. And I'd also like to mention that I am the candidate endorsed by our, our Monroe County um, Sheriff Deputy Association. I'm incredibly proud to have the endorsement of these men that put their lives, their lives on the line every day for us. Okay. And we have, oops, sorry. One more question in chat. We'll, Ms. Arb, we'll stay with you. Uh, how many grants have you personally gotten and do you think that should be part of the plan for Bedford Township? So I, I do think grants should be a part of the plan for Bedford Township. I, and and I, I will fact check myself after this. I believe I've brought in 24 different grants from various, uh, um, from uh, the VA, Prostera Center, Moscow Family Foundation, Fred Wilpon, Afuel Sinair, Ethel and James Flynn. Um, <laughs> I don't have a comprehensive list right now, but 2.5 million over four years. I also recently had the opportunity to talk to the Lazy Boy Center about some of their grant opportunities. And I think there's some exciting opportunities for Bedford Township in our future. I'm sorry, Lazy Boy Foundation. Oh, gotcha. Okay, Mr. Prone, same, same question. Um, well, with the uh, Lewis Avenue Redevelopment Committee that I uh, helped create, we were able to receive a grant um, with a match. So we, we ended up spending about $400,000 in downtown temperance. Uh, the Road Commission in partnership with us, we we're going after a grant for the roundabout, uh, which there was no money lost. Uh, I, I heard that uh, uh, said earlier in the discussion. Uh, actually, it's a great investment on a dilapidated piece of property. Um, but that's for another topic. Um, we received uh, money for the ordinance department through our insurance company for uh, body cams, which was great. Uh, we're looking at a grant right now that we're writing for our uh, historical uh, museum off Stearns and Crab uh, for $14,000. Um, we received a grant uh, in the downtown development uh, in Lambertville. Um, that was uh, when uh, Greg Stewart was supervisor and I was trustee. So. We continue to work for grants. We have a grant right now uh, that we received through COVID for $28,000. Um, it's something we continue to do and uh, we're, we're very successful at. Okay, so we'll, we'll stay with you and final 30 seconds, uh, closing thoughts. I'll just say that I'm the opponent that has the experience. I've lived in this community for my whole life. Um, I know the needs. I've worked very hard. This isn't my retirement job. Um, I've been very successful and done things that no supervisor has ever done. We removed snow from roads in the first seven hours in 127 subdivisions without creating more tax. People have a place to drop their leaves, their grass, and their brush nine months out of the year without paying for it. Now, when you drive around in burning season, you, don't, you, can't, uh, you can actually see when you drive down the roads because not, it's not filled with smoke. Uh, we're creating a great environment for our community with the Blizzard Fest, the Summer's Fest, the Temper Street Fest, the Farmer's Market that I all help, I helped create all of these things. Five seconds. Um, so I'm the guy for the position. I've proven it. Okay, excellent. All right, Ms. Zarb, final 30 seconds. Yeah, I've spent the last three and a half years researching how municipalities recover from crisis. I've interviewed municipal officials. I've looked at budgeting. I know grant writing. I know what good governance and financial transparency look like. And I also know what corruption and governing for personal gain looks like. And if I wasn't concerned, I wouldn't be here. It's true, I've been asked to run many times and I've always said no. This time when I was asked to run for this position, I felt obligated. The same way I felt obligated when my country was under attack to go to war. The same way I felt obligated to go to Lansing when our veterans were being left behind. And I went toe to toe with Governor Snyder and Governor Whitmer. Five seconds. Where I see injustice, I get involved. And I'm here in Bedford Township to be a leader who cares about our residents because they deserve it. Excellent. Thank you so much, everybody. That is that will that is the conclusion of our um, of our Q and A forum. 
Uh, I thank everybody for, for tuning in and for the candidates uh, to, for serving and for agreeing, agreeing to uh, join us tonight. Thank you, everybody. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Yes, yes, let's uh, let our president have the final closing thoughts here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, th thank you all for be being uh, um, with us this evening. So don't, don't all leave just yet, just a couple of comments from me. Um, I, I heard some mention of a charge station, uh, charge stations being in some places. There's here in, in Monroe, we do have two charging stations on our campus and they are free of charge. We have that here at Yale Community College. And, and for the folks from Bedford, I was surprised that no one mentioned the Whitman Center and that and none of the candidates mentioned the Whitman Center, which is part of that Lewis Avenue, uh, uh, that is on Lewis Avenue and, and it's very, very viable. The ISD transition center is there as well as the, the uh, Spring Arbor. Spring Ar Arbor is all, all also there. and. With our millage plants, our intention is to put a charge station there, also an electric charge station at the Whitman Center, as well as a uh, geothermal system. But I want to thank you all for being involved this evening. Good luck to all of you, and um, we'll see you around. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Great job moderating. Much appreciated. Thank you. See you, babe. I put my shoes All right, on. babe. <laughs>